El Cid is an interesting character. A Spanish folk hero, a chivalric icon of the Reconquista, the subject of many a romance novel. And yet, this isn't Sir Galahad we're talking about here. For all his talents, El Cid was a man with ambition. In 1057, he was just a knight, but soon all of Iberia, Christian and Muslim alike, would respect and fear the man known as El Cid, the lord and champion who forged his own kingdom. For in the midst of chaos, there is opportunity. Sir Donaday, we have work to do. Our lord sends us on a new campaign to- Eek! Stop what you're doing right now! Oh, perdona me, El Cid. I just picked up Crusader Kings 3 again. You know how I played this game all the time on release. And now there's a DLC and it's all about us and the Reconquista! They updated the map, there's new costumes, a new system for the struggle against the Moors. Donaday, you turn off that computer right this instant! I've seen what that game does to my men before. When it sinks its teeth into you, it doesn't let go. Just a minute, I'm so close to fabricating a claim on Portugal. Foolish summer child! There is always just one last thing you want to do. You're not just living out 600 years of medieval history. We're talking about every possible iteration of 600 years of history, plus DLC, and so, so many mods. We're talking about hundreds of polities with their own internal divisions, advisors, court factions. Okay, done. El Cid? Crusader Kings 3, The Fate of Iberia. Get your copy at play.crusaderkings.com slash Jack Rackham or by following the link in the description. Please play responsibly. The sun is beginning to rise and your family misses you. The knight known as El Cid came from beginnings best described as humble-ish. His father was a courtier, his mother the daughter of a nobleman who was in charge of a couple of little parishes, but everyone loves an underdog, so we sometimes just pretend he's a simple man of humble means, because that's all he really needs to be the perfect knight. He's already said to be brave and loyal and pious, and what a time the 11th century was to be a knight. Lightning round overview of the Reconquista for you in case you need some context or need to decide when to begin your CK3 campaign. Early 700s, the Umayyad Caliphate takes over Hispania. A couple decades later, their dynasty collapses. This one prince goes on an unexpected journey across North Africa and manages to hold on to his lands in Spain and creates the Emirate of Cordoba. Link to that video in the doobly-doo. So if you're starting in Iberia in the year 867, those are the people you're dealing with, along with the little bitty Christian kingdom of Asturias up north. But by 1066, the south had fallen apart, and so you're dealing with all these little states called taifas. And then up north, the Christian kingdom of Asturias had gone and split itself up too, because Gavilkind's succession is so stupid! Don't be fooled. The Reconquista ended with a great hoopla about taking back the last lands from the Muslim invaders, but at this point, everyone was divided, everyone was fighting everyone, everyone needed knights, and the best knights could charge a high price. Rodrigo Diaz, that's El Cid's real name, made a name for himself in the service of Prince Sancho of Castile, but that name he made wasn't El Cid. As a young man, he fought in the king's army, front lines, marching through the heat, feet blistered, storming the castle of Zaragoza, clashing against the armies of Aragon in the valley of the river Cinca. It was in that campaign he won single combat against an Aragonese knight, earning himself the title El Campeador, the champion. That's the name the Spanish Christians actually called him during his life. The El Cid thing was something they called him in some of the taifas. Means something like the Lord or the Master. <laughs> but El Campeador seems to have been his moniker of choice. So, there's a whole narrative arc here about El Cid serving the crown prince Sancho II as a young man, and then when King Ferdinand dies, he splits up his kingdom among his sons, and Sancho is hell-bent on conquering his brother's lands at any cost. The noble El Cid is reluctant to raise his sword for conquest, but above all, he's loyal to his lord, and over time, the humble knight earns the king's favor by negotiating the end of the war with Zaragoza and forcing the emir to yield to his new king. For reasons that should be obvious later, I wanted to make this whole episode into a berserk parallel, but that whole section I just described is filled to the brim with citation needed. And the more scholarly sources I've found seem to mention some of this stuff in passing, but usually with the addendum that it's mostly unsupported. So if you're making a movie about El Cid, his rise to fame and his relationship with Sancho II, go for it. But alas, I would be remiss to bring it all up as fact. What I can say for certain, 
Before Sancho could achieve his dreams of stealing all his brother's stuff, one of those brothers, I can't say he assassinated Sancho, there's not quite enough evidence for that, but Sancho was very conveniently murdered, leaving his brother Alfonso as the heir to his kingdom, and of course, the inheritor of his dream to take the rest of his brother's stuff. What made this slightly awkward is that El Cid had fought with Sancho to dethrone Alfonso just a few years ago, but that didn't seem to be a huge issue. Matter of fact, El Cid got to marry the king's cousin, how about that? So one day in 1079, the Cid is sent to Sevilla, a taifa that owed its loyalty to Alfonso. And he's gonna go down there, collect some taxes, head back north, when suddenly, he spots an army on the horizon. Noble Rodrigo snaps into action and takes command of the forces of Sevilla, and by a miracle, the unprepared commander turns the battle and captures the enemy leaders. All right, scumbag, let's see who you really are. Castilian Magistrate Count Garcia Ordonez? You meddling kid! But why? Because King Alfonso ordered me! He set me up! We didn't even know you were still here! He teamed up with Granada to take over Sevilla, what the hell, bro? Why didn't you tell me? I thought I was bravely defending his tributary against all odds! Months of martial planning wasted! King Alfonso banished El Cid. But like, a year later, it's possible there was more court intrigue involved and it wasn't just this one hilarious little whoopsie. Curse historical nuance! El Cid packed his things and wandered the land as a knight without a master. He sent a job application to Barcelona, but apparently the count there wasn't impressed with his resume. And so he travels to the Taifa of Zaragoza, whose capital he stormed 20 years ago, and they tell him, you're telling me you defeated the combined forces of Castile and Granada with just the local garrison and your personal retinue? Something like that, probably. My boy, you're hired. What do you think of the name El Cid? Eh? It'll catch on eventually. Yet in just a couple years, Aragon and Barcelona attacked Zaragoza, and with El Cid's help, they couldn't make a dent. Actually, the Count of Barcelona got captured. I'm not saying it. Saying what? I'm not saying it. Oh, you mean how much you wish I was in your army right now. Ugh. You don't need to say it. Because I know you're thinking it. Did you know they're writing books about me? My lord. Yes? yes? Uh, him. They call me El Cid. It means the lord. A message from King Alfonso. Hey, missed you. What's up? You never text me. This had better be good, Alfonso. What? I just wanted to catch up? I see you're doing very well for yourself here. Me? Oh, you know, I took over Toledo. Good for you. Yeah, yeah. Rodrigo, you've gotta come back! I took over Toledo and now these zealots from Morocco are all up in our business and they nearly killed me! Please, I need El Campeador. See? He gets it. Why? Why, Al Said? He banished you! He doesn't love you like I do! Why indeed? Well, it certainly wasn't out of loyalty. The armies from Morocco subsided to deal with internal politics for a couple of years, and in the meantime, El Cid managed to convince Alfonso that what they really needed to defend Castile and Leon from the Almoravids was not to focus on defending the south, but the east. He captured the Count of Barcelona again, CURSE YOU EL CID, and claimed suzerainty over Valencia, collecting taxes in the name of King Alfonso, and just, you know, holding on to them for safekeeping. Alfonso's thinking might have been that giving El Cid control over Valencia would at least create an allied buffer state, but, um... Geography suggests otherwise. Soon enough, the Almoravid armies came back up into Spain, took over all the taifas in the south, and waged war on Alfonso. You're weak, old man! Like the taifas, your indolence shall be your doom! For I have come to reclaim these lands in the name of God! Ha ha ha! But I am not alone. By my side fights a man who has never been defeated in combat! Come! El Cid! Well, I went looking for you, but I couldn't find your army. I know, we must have been like ships in the night. But hey, I managed to save one of your towns, and they said they wanted me to handle your tax money for you. I know, that's what I told them. Okay, bye-bye.
Alfonso banished him for a second time. El Cid eventually conquered Valencia properly and lived there peacefully with his wife. The soldier with dreams of glory had finally gotten his kingdom, and he didn't even have to sacrifice all his friends to a bunch of demons to get it. He did end up dying in the middle of a siege once the Almoravids showed up, though.